Vs is Vc plus Vr. This is in a time domain. Take Laplace transform on both sides. This also holds true in the frequency domain. Okay? That's the first thing. Then the second thing is we take this entire circuit and reduce it into impedance blocks. Okay? This is the process we were doing last class. We see that we have the same current flowing through. So it is uh, I of S passing through the same impedance blocks, which means they are in series. And so I can add up these two impedances to get an effective impedance. Okay? So the effective impedance is going to be ZR plus ZC. So in the Laplace domain, once again, I don't have my mic, so please, I appreciate your patience. Z equal it. ZC <coughs> plus ZR. Okay? <coughs> And how do we know that they are in series? Because they have the same current flowing through. So if I bring out the impedances of uh, the resistor and the capacitor, this is R plus 1 by C times S, common factor. So this is R C S plus 1 over C. Okay, this is all old stuff. I'm sure you've seen this in other courses as well, but we will be doing it in a slightly different manner here. Okay? Once I have the equivalent, I can now draw the equivalent circuit. And before that, we note that Zc is Vc by I. And likewise, we have Zr is Vr by I of S. Zc is 1 by Cs. Okay. All right. Now we write the final equation. I have reduced it to a single impedance block. Here is the figure I typically draw. Yes. It's the equivalent. And the current is I minus. Obviously, you know, Z equivalent is a transfer function, so this is the ratio of the voltage across that element and the current flowing through that element in the Laplace domain. Z equivalent is Vs by I of S. Substitute for Z equivalent. This gives me the following. Cs by Cs, so I'm going to cross multiply, so the Cs gets attached to the Vs, then I of S gets attached to Rcs plus 1. Okay, so I have Rcs plus 1. <coughs> okay. But this is not what I want. C and Vs. But that can be easily obtained by substituting for I of S in terms of Vc and Cs. So you note, I of S is uh, essentially Cs. And so we perform this substitution. Okay. And so I have 
Our C is plus 1. C is VCFS. C is VS. Factor of CS on both sides cancels off. <coughs> so I have the following now. This is gone. This is gone. So R C S plus one B C is B S of S. Or the system transfer function that I'm requiring here. I'm going to call it as TC because this is with respect to the capacitor of it. So TC of S, which is the output, by the input, is essentially 1 by RCS plus 1. in the Laplacian domain or the frequency domain, you could invert it back, which is what I will do next. I have RC times S. If I invert it back, I get RC V dot of C. Okay, so invert this expression here. So RC VC times S, inverse of that RC VC dot. Inverse of VC of S is VC of T. It's a time constant. It's a first order time constant. How do we know it has units of time? Okay, so look at R. What is resistance? Voltage by current. So this is volts or amperes. Current is rate of change of charge. So amperes is coulombs per second. So this is essentially volts by coulomb. Times seconds. Okay? Amperes is coulombs per second. I just took the seconds and brought it up to the numerator. What's capacitance? The charge stored by a capacitor is directly proportional to the voltage. The constant of proportionality is the capacitance of the capacitor. So this is charge divided by volts. If I take the product of R times C, you see there is a volt in the denominator, there is a volt in the numerator, there is a coulomb in the denominator, a coulomb in the numerator, and left in seconds. <coughs> Which is why it's called a time constant. Because it still has units of seconds, even though you're doing something in electrical systems. It still had the same units of seconds when we were in mechanical systems, Mass divided by the damping constant. That was tau for us. Okay, so this is nothing but tau. System time. Okay, 
so this is the system OD. Big deal. But I want to go a step further. What I want to do is, we are told the voltage is A times sine omega t, the source voltage, the supply voltage. What is the system response? What's the voltage like across the terminals of the capacitor? How do I get that? Okay. Here is what we do. I'm going to pull this panel down. And uh, we are going to come to our uh, big claim of the day very soon, which will be quite interesting. People in the back, can you still hear me? Okay. All right. I'm going to rewrite this relationship from the previous panel. Okay. It's R C S plus one capital R capital C V C of S is V S of S. Okay. V S of T is A sine omega T. I want to solve for Vc of t, so obviously the next step is to perform the partial fraction decomposition. I'm not going to go through the entire thing, I'm just going to write the decomposition first. Okay? S plus 1 by tau. That's going to have one coefficient attached to it. So I have Vc, which is the omega by tau. Do the partial fraction decomposition. This is C1 by S plus 1 by tau. S squared plus omega squared. You have a sinusoidal input. You expect a sinusoidal output, so you're going to have the combination of C2S plus C3. But if you want, you can write it in the form that you know it. Problems. This was zero square plus omega. It's in there. This is all old stuff. Okay? You're just using Laplace transforms to solve for a different type of a system. Solve an electric system. You can find C1, C2, C3. I'm just going to list them here. Okay? Matching coefficients. C1. Is the following. 
a omega tau by 1 plus tau square omega square c2 and c3 are the more important of the terms and you'll see why c2 is minus a omega tau by same denominator How did we get these? Matching coefficients on both sides. This is regular stuff that we've been doing all along the semester. Okay? Nothing new so far. C3 is plus A omega, same term. I'm not going to substitute yet. I have a couple of things to do. So if I find C1, C2, and C3, before I do the inverse, we do the following. Okay? So we C of S. Not much to do with C1, so leave that fellow as it is. So C1, <coughs> S plus 1 by tau. C2, S plus C3, I split it. Okay? So this is plus C2. S square plus omega square, if there was a frequency shift, that is if it was not S plus zero square here, then we would have employed one of our tricks. We would have added and subtracted a term, and then we would have taken the inverse of that, that would have given us a cosine term. Okay, we don't need to do that here because this is zero here. Right? We would typically add a zero, subtract a zero if you want. Okay? Then the last term is C3. We expect a sine term from this, and the Laplace transform of the sine term, as you know, contains the frequency variable right there. So I'm going to divide and multiply the omega. Take the inverse Laplace. first one, there is no time shifts here, so this is just going to be an exponential term multiplied by the step function starting at 0, so C1 minus C by tau, inverse Laplace of the second term gives you a cosine omega t multiplied by C2, there is no exponential term because this is 0, plus 0 minus 0, this is S plus 0 whole square. So you typically perform the same operation on the last one and C3 by omega sine Once again, there are no surprises here. This is regular stuff. We've done this for multiple problems. We've done much more difficult problems with time delays as well, so nothing to think about here. Okay? But one thing we want to do is this. Okay, what is our aim? Our aim is I have this source voltage, okay, which is a sinusoidal signal. I am not interested in the near term behavior of the system. I'm not interested in the short term behavior of the system. What's the short term behavior of the system? It's governed by this creature here. What's it going to do after some time? It's going to decay. So after some time has picked up, there will be absolutely no contributions from this term at all. The only contributions when I go to steady state behavior is going to come from the cosine and the sine terms. This is clear to everybody? When I look at the short term behavior, of course, there will be a slight decay. Who cares? I am interested in steady state behavior. I turn the switch on. Okay, what kind of uh, voltage do I get across the terminals of the capacitor? Not after 5 milliseconds, but after 10 seconds. Okay? So for us, what 
we are going to do is this. From now on, when you are performing frequency analysis, you are always going to look at the steady state behavior of the system. Okay, so for us this term does not have much meaning. And so I'm going to write it as Vc steady state in the next panel. Is the fourth one. So that steady state. to zero and so I have Vc is uh, C1 I'm going to substitute for I'm sorry C2 substitute for that so A omega tau 1 plus tau square omega square lots of writing but we will eventually come to a very nice conclusion where there is no writing needed at all everything is in your head be careful, there is an omega in the denominator of that last expression, so this is divided by omega sin of omega. Once again, where does this creature come from? This creature comes from the fact that C3 is divided by the omega, okay? And obviously, you know, my next step is to cancel. Right. And I'm going to do something that is really obvious, as you see. One, one plus tau square omega square, I'm going to write it as a form. One by square root, one plus omega square tau square, multiplied by the same creature. Make sense to everybody? I'm just taking something and multiplying it by his square root. Square it, you get the same one there. So nothing has changed. Now, watch this very carefully. I'm going to take A as a common factor. Here, this is a common factor, that's also a common factor. I'm not going to take the entire creature. I'm going to replace them by this product here, but take only one of the square roots out. I'm going to write it out now. Okay. All of these mental calisthenics will have some meaning very soon. So I have A omega square root tau square omega square. <coughs> what do I have left? Minus omega tau. Then I'm going to be left with a square root term. Square root 1 plus and cosine omega t plus 1 1 plus tau square omega square sine. took the factor of A as a common factor, that's fine. I take this guy, I multiply that, I get the same denominator as here. I do the same thing for sine, I get the same denominator as I originally started off. So nothing has changed, I'm just rearranging the furniture. Okay? Now, we're going to say the following. This is, this is a lot of stuff to write. Okay? So I want to come up with a succinct way of saying. So this is A. Y, 1 plus tau 
plus tau square omega square, leave that as it is, and inside, I'm going to replace that by a phase shifted sine wave with a magnitude d. And the question is, what is this phase phi? What is this magnitude d? Okay. I'm going to expand. So this is. A by 1 plus tau square omega square, square root of that. And I have this d sine omega t plus phi. That's d sine phi. Cosine omega t. D cosine phi. And uh, with your permission, I'm going to take, take care of this panel here. Okay. You see what our next step is going to be? I want to calculate d. I want to calculate this angle phi. So what are those creatures? And why are we doing all these things? Look at the equation that we have here. Compare that with this creature here. This term is the same as that. Yes, question. How did you get from your second equation to your third equation? Oh, I'm just expanding <coughs> sine a plus b. Okay, so sine a plus b is uh, sine a cos b. Okay. So I'm just using the formula to expand it because I don't want to keep writing this garbage all the time. I want to write it in this nice manner. Right? This sine omega t plus phi. So if I now do the equations, uh, or if I do the equivalence between the two, I have minus omega tau or tau omega 1 plus Square. That's the first equivalence. D times cosine phi is the same as 1 by square root of that. Right, so those two are the same. equations two unknowns. Anybody tell me what is capital D now? Yes. Is it the one over square root thing? Let's take a look at it. Let me square this term. Let me square the term. Okay? D square, sine square phi, and add them up. Minus tau omega, if you square it, the omega square tau square, the negative sign cancels out. The square root becomes that. Can you now tell me what is capital D? It's one. All of this hoopla for nothing. <laughs> Why is it one? It's because I can take a common factor of d square here, so I get sine square phi plus cosine square phi, which is one. Here, one plus tau square omega square is a common factor, so I have tau square omega square plus one. Numerator and denominator cancel each other off, so I get d is equal to one, which is quite nifty. How do I get phi? I just divide one by the other. So tan phi. 
I take the sine phi, I take the cosine phi, I divide one by the other, they have a common denominator, <coughs> cancels off. I get minus tau omega or phi is minus tan inverse of tau. It's actually tan inverse of minus tau omega, but tan inverse of minus a is minus tan inverse of a. You make use of all of these trigonometric gymnastics and you end up with this. So this is really cool. d is equal to 1, phi is very simple. Instead of writing this lengthy expression, I am now going to write the modified word. And I want to see if there are any questions. What am I trying to do? I am trying to obtain vc of t. Okay? We have done that. We are successful. This is vc of t. Fantastic. This is a lot of stuff to write. I have no intuitive feel on what this fellow is even trying to do here. Right? What is this trying to do? <coughs> I have no idea. So I say, okay, wait a minute. Let me simplify it a little bit. Can I put it in this phase shifted form? And if so, what is the magnitude? What is the phase? Magnitude is 1. The phase is all of that. So here is the moral of the story. I'm going to pull this panel down. Eventually, this is what we get. Okay, so input ds is an omega t. What kind of an input is this? This is a harmonic input. So this is something that we have always been talking about. This is the big claim of the day. This is not new. The big claim of the day is, and once again, this is a steady state. I should mention it. This is the steady state solution. The big claim of the day is, if I have a harmonic input, no matter what type of a system analysis you are performing, first order, second order, nth order, does not matter. My output is also going to be harmonic. And not only that, I have a way of obtaining all of this information without going through any of the math, as you're going to see. Okay? So I'm just going to write this up before we go into those details. Here is my system. Okay? System is represented by its transfer function. So this is T of S. I have a harmonic input signal. Let's say f of t. f of t is a mass and omega t. Nothing special about sine, you can call it as A, B, cosine, omega, T. The same thing will come out. And that's not surprising. So this is essentially a sinusoidal function. T. Some, T. Some signal f of T, okay? Does not need to be voltage, it could be a force. 
it would be temperature. What's my output? My output is also harmonic. Steady state. Solution. <coughs> and the nice thing is the output takes on a form that is very similar to the input. So I would say, here is my output x of t, is some magnitude. That's not in the Laplace domain, it is some magnitude multiplied by the same input signal with a shift in the phase. Okay, so this is a phase shift. shifted by a certain amount, its magnitude could be larger or smaller than the input. Who knows? So that could be your output shift. And this is the basis of frequency response analysis. The fundamental idea, which is also used in Fourier series analysis. I take any random signal. Could be whatever it is. I can always break it up into an infinite number of sinusoidal pieces which is the Fourier theorem. Then I take all of these sinusoidal input pieces, input them to the system. What's my output going to be? If it's a linear system, I should make that note here, linear system. The linear system is just going to give me a set of harmonic outputs which kind of mimic what the input is trying to do. Okay. And we're going to build on this, and that's going to be the rest of our class for the day. And I want to do a few things. This is just a recap, okay, a recap of uh, complex numbers. So this is a digression. But always remember that picture. If I have a linear system, I have a harmonic input, I will always get a harmonic output no matter what it is. This is the essence of Fourier analysis. Okay, this is a Fourier theorem essentially, in some sense. Okay, I digress here. Take a complex number. Right, you have good old Laplace variable s. So the real of s is sigma. Imaginary part is omega. This same complex number can be written in a different form using the Euler identity. Okay? So I can also write as r times e to the power j multiplied by phi. And if I bring in the Euler identity, The way to pronounce his name is Euler, like oiling something. E to the power J phi is cosine phi <coughs> J times sine phi, where J is square root of minus 1. And this is stuff you have come across, perhaps. How are they equal to each other? Here is the quick. That is, what is R and what is phi? I just equate the two. Sigma plus A omega. This is equal to capital R, some magnitude R. And uh, e to the power j phi substitute the Euler identity, cosine phi, j sine phi. This is exactly what we did 
a few minutes ago. Equate the real terms, equate the imaginary terms. Okay, so the real terms on both sides. Sigma R times cosine phi. Imaginary terms, R times sine phi and omega. You obviously know what is R. R square is sigma square plus omega square. So the magnitude of the complex number S and phi, which is the I'm going to write it in a general form. This is the tan inverse of the imaginary part by the real part. So this is imaginary by the real. This is tan inverse of omega by sigma. This is the face. And why is this important? I'm going to pause, see if there are any questions. Basic stuff. I've seen this before. This is just a refresh. What is the ramification for us? Is the following. But before that, one more digression. Two common numbers. Okay. So some A plus JB divided by another complex number. C plus J times D. Some random C, some random D, and so on. The first one I can write as the following. Some magnitude e to the power J times phi 1. by the real part. The second number I'm going to write it as R2 times e to the power j phi 2. Where R2 c square d square d by c. Another complex number. This whole thing is some e plus j times f, where the magnitude is nothing but the ratio of r1 to r2. And if I take e to the power j phi 2 onto the numerator, Go back to my solution. Okay, so recall. We 
C of T transfer function this was the transfer function we had do the following substitution substitute s is equal to j times omega okay substitute 